The Aleutian IL-2 was a single-engine low-wing monoplane of mixed construction specially designed by the Soviet Central Design Bureau for ground assault operations. Mass-produced to provide close air support at very low altitude to ground forces, it played a critical role in the Eastern Front's large-scale offensives. Designated Sturmovik, a generic Russian term for heavily armored ground attack aircraft, the IL-2 was known affectionately as the Ilyusha to its pilots. To others, it was called the Hunchback, the Flying Tank, and the Flying Infantryman. And while Soviet propaganda was wont to vastly over-exaggerate the IL-2's effectiveness, to German opposition forces on the ground it gained the nickname Schwarze Todd, or Black Death, for its devastating ground attacks, and Luftwaffe pilots came to call it Zement Bomber, the Concrete Bomber, for its ability to withstand damage. Utilized exclusively by the Soviet Union during World War II, post-war it would become a staple of the Bulgarian, Hungarian, Polish, Mongolian, Czech, and Yugoslav air forces, designated the NATO reporting name, Bark. With a massive 36,183 IL-2s built, it was the single most produced military aircraft design in aviation history. With its history of low-level ground support, it is little wonder that the IL-2's origins trace back to the Soviet Union's recognition of the need for a specialized ground attack aircraft in the early 1930s. With the Sturmovik concept developed by Dmitry Pavlovich Grigorovich in the form of the TSH-1 and TSH-2 armored biplanes. However, Soviet engines at the time failed to provide the power needed to fly the heavy aircraft with reasonable performance. So while a popular concept for the low-level airspace of Russia, the development stalled. But influenced by the experience of over a thousand Soviet pilots who flew for the Republican Air Force during the Spanish Civil War, the Soviet Air Force identified the need for a heavily armored aircraft capable of operating in direct support of ground troops while surviving intense anti-aircraft fire. Importantly, a capability with a direct endorsement of Stalin himself. This need gave rise to a competition to develop a robust ground attack aircraft. From the Central Design Bureau, Sergei Ilyushin and his team were engaged in 1938, whilst their competition, the JSC Sukhoi Company, entered the fray with the SHB, an armored version of the SU-2. The Sukhoi Design Bureau prototype a single-seat armored ground attack aircraft first flew on the 1st of March 1941. Report results by test pilot Antonov Kokin indicated that the Su-6 was superior to the Ilyushin IL-2 in nearly all performance categories. But in one of those twists of fate, the radial Shvetsov M-71 engines the Su-6 utilized became unavailable, and the prototype's engine had reached end of life. The Sukhoi Design Bureau persisted with two more prototypes, the last to utilize the liquid-cooled Mikulin AM-42 engine. But as light tests began on the 22nd of February 1944, the re-engine SU-6 proved inferior to the newly upgraded Ilyushin EL-10. The successful Sergei Ilyushin and his team produced the TSKB-55 prototype, a two-seat aircraft beating the Sukhoi team by a year and a half, flying on the 2nd of October 1939. It was designed with an armoured shell weighing in at 1,500 pounds, with plates of various thickness protecting the crew, engine, radiators and fuel tank. Being a full 15% of the aircraft's gross weight, the armour plating was designed to be a load-bearing part of the monocoque structure, with the plates replacing the frame and panelling throughout the nacelle and middle part of the fuselage. But still, concerns about its engine being underpowered for such mass saw the second prototype, the TSKB-57, constructed as a single-seater. The new prototype first flew on the 12th of October 1940, hurried through state acceptance trials in March 1941, gaining its IL-2 designation. By April 41, it was ordered into production at four factories. The IL-2's initial production was of a single-seat aircraft that measured 11.65 meters long, having a wingspan of 14.6 meters, 
a height of 4.17 meters and a wing area of 38.5 square meters. Powered by a Mikulin AM38 liquid-cooled V12 engine capable of 1,720 horsepower, it had a maximum speed of 410 kilometers per hour at 1,500 meters, a range of 765 kilometers, a flight endurance of 2 hours and 45 minutes, a service ceiling of 4,525 meters, and a time to 5,000 meters altitude of 15 minutes. Due to the weight of its armor, it had a somewhat diminished payload. At the start of its production, some earlier aircraft were fitted with two fixed forward-firing 20mm cannons until the new TKB-201 23mm cannons, specifically designed for the IL-2s as tank busters, became available. The TKB-201 cannons used a powerful new 23 by 152 mm cartridge. Belt fed it had a rate of fire of 600 rounds per minute. As well as the cannons, it had two fixed forward-firing 7.62x54mm SHKAS machine guns, each with 750 rounds. It could mount eight RS-82 rockets or four of the heavier RS-132 rockets or a complement of six 100kg bombs in wing bomb bays and underwing. And in 1943, it became the primary carrier of the new P-TAB, a 2.5-kilogram high-explosive anti-tank shape-charged bomb. It could either carry 192 in the four external dispensers or 280 in its underwing bomb bays. More on the effectiveness of the IL-2's weapons later. Following production, it wasn't long before the lack of a tail gunner was resulting in a very high loss rate from enemy aircraft strafing from above and behind. By the beginning of March 1942, the Soviets were forced to modify the aircraft's fuselage to accommodate a rear gunner just behind the pilot. Future IL-2s incorporated the gunnery position, while existing aircraft were field modified with holes cut in the fuselage and the gunner sat on a sling. The gunner was equipped with a 12.7mm aft-facing machine gun on a swivel mount with 300 rounds of ammunition. Whilst improving its air defence capabilities, the addition of the rear gunner also increased the aircraft's overall weight, reducing its airspeed by almost 20 km per hour, and because the centre of gravity had shifted backwards, pilots started reporting handling difficulties. But in October 42, a third variant of the IL-2 was introduced featuring an upgraded AM-38 engine, which vastly improved its takeoff and low-altitude performance, as well as an extension of the aircraft's wing flaps to increase its handling response. Sadly, it's worth noting armor plating did not extend to the rear gunner's position, and by the end of the war the Soviets were losing four IL-2 rear gunners to every one of its pilots. The IL-2's combat initiation came on June 27, 1941, just five days after Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union with Operation Barbarossa, when five IL-2s attacked a German convoy of tanks and mechanized infantry. But numbers committed were low. Only State Aviation Factory No. 18 at Voronezh and Factory No. 381 at Leningrad had commenced production. And of these, a mere 70 were actually in service at that time. Even worse, only 20 of them were in service with the frontier military districts. The state of the IL-2's pilots training was at best minimal, and operational air tactics that ultimately would make the IL-2 so successful were non-existent. In the first three days, 10 IL-2s were lost to enemy action, a further 19 were lost to other causes, and 20 pilots were killed. By the 10th of July, numbers were down to just 10. A less than illustrious start to an aircraft Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin had personally backed. And with the shift of aircraft factories beyond the Ural Mountains, out of range of the Germans, Ilyushin and his engineers paused to undertake a review into the aircraft's production methods before recommencing. Greatly angered by the pause, Stalin sent the following somewhat terse and threatening missive. You have let down our country and our Red Army, 
You have the nerve not to manufacture IL-2s until now. Our Red Army now needs IL-2 aircraft, like the air it breathes, like the bread it eats. Schenkman produces one IL-2 a day, and Tretyakov builds one or two MiG-3s daily. It is a mockery of our country and the Red Army. I ask you not to try the government's patience and demand that you manufacture more ILs. This is my final warning. Needless to say, production increased markedly somewhat immediately. Indeed, central control economies, combined with a reputation of low tolerance and high retribution, can spur an immediate productivity gain. Not that I endorse such a thing. But another characteristic of totalitarian regimes means one must address the difficulty of determining the effectiveness of the IL-2 in the face of Soviet propaganda, which greatly embellished its impact in battles. For instance, during the Battle of Kursk, the Soviets claimed the destruction of no less than 270 tanks in a period of just two hours against the 3rd Panzer Division by IL-2s. Then they destroyed 240 tanks and in the process virtually wiped out the 17th Panzer Division in a period of just four hours. But studies of the fighting at Kursk suggest that very few of German armor losses were caused by the IL-2. Indeed, the claims were wildly exaggerated. So to better understand the IL-2's effectiveness as a tank buster, we are better to examine its weapons platform. Firstly, the TKB-201 23mm autocannon. Despite its large round, it proved to be a disappointment in its intended anti-tank role. Light German tanks could be defeated from the side or rear only, with front armor of all tanks impervious. Medium tanks could be defeated if hit into the top of the turret or the engine compartment from under 1300 feet in a greater than 40 degree dive, an almost impossible ask. The RS-80, like most unguided rockets, suffered from poor accuracy. Early testing demonstrated that, when fired from 1,600 feet, a mere 1.1% 1 .1 of 186 rockets fired hit a single tank and only 3.7% hit a column of tanks. The heavier RS-132 rockets were worse, with no hits scored in 134 firings during one test. And while the RS-82 could destroy a tank with a direct hit and the larger RS-132 could knock out a tank with a near miss, compared to contemporary rockets, they were quite underpowered, holding an explosive weight of just 0.45 and 0.9 kilograms respectively, while the British Typhoon's RP-3 rockets held 5.5 kilograms of explosive. The Protivo Tankovaya Avia Bomba, shortened to PTAB, were introduced in 1943 and were particularly effective against tanks because they could be dropped in large numbers over an area, increasing the likelihood of hits on tank tops where armor was thinner. These 2.5 kilogram bombs were either loaded directly into the bomb bays or clustered in external dispensers, then dropped en masse onto enemy vehicles from altitudes up to 330 feet. As a single IL-2 could carry either 280 or 192 bombs, each with an explosive core of 0.62 kilograms, they produced a kill box 230 feet long and 50 feet wide that would have a very high probability of destroying enemy tanks within. The Battle of Kursk saw the first large-scale use of PTABs. One credible report from this battle mentions six IL-2s destroying 15 tanks in one attack. By the end of 1943, Soviet records show that 1.17 million PTABs were dropped. In 1944, the number rose to 5 million. And in the first four months of 1945, a further 3.2 million PTABs were used. The vast majority were dropped by the IL-2. So propaganda aside, the IL-2's nicknames were well earned. As its numbers in the sky grew and its tactics improved, it wreaked havoc and caused substantial loss of German personnel, seeking and destroying logistics vital to the continued German war effort. Lack of available Russian fighter protection, however, for the vulnerable and slow-moving IL-2s often led to severe losses in combat. 
In the spring and summer of 1942, for example, IL-2s were being lost at the very high rate of one for every 24 combat sorties. During the Battle of Stalingrad, where conditions were terrible with low visibility and a lack of fighter protection, the loss ratio rose to one aircraft per 10 combat missions. But attrition was not new for the Soviet Army. In 1942, 11,552 IL-2s were produced. They were replaced as soon as they fell from the sky in even greater numbers. 1943 saw a further 10,900 built and 10,700 in 1944. As well, the IL-2 was very easy to learn and forgiving to novice pilots, making training periods incredibly short. Just 60 to 90 hours, very short, considering RAF fighter pilots training consisted of 225 flight hours. Thankfully, in mid-1943, at the Battle of Kursk, General Ryazanov became a master in the use of attack aircraft en masse, developing and improving the tactics of IL-2 operations in coordination with infantry, artillery, and armored troops. IL-2s at Kursk used the circle of death tactic, where 8 to 12 aircraft formed a defensive circle, each plane protecting the one ahead with its forward machine guns, while individual Sturmoviks took turns leaving the circle, attacking a target and rejoining the circle. By June 1944, Operation Bagration saw 1,744 IL-2s supporting Stalin's offensive push west. To the south, over a thousand IL-2s joined the Vistula Oda offensive, and thousands more supported troops and ran sorties across the wide expanse of the Eastern Front. Before in April 1945, the IL-2 was instrumental in the final assault on Berlin. The IL-2 was also widely used by the Soviet Navy's air arm. An effective method of attack against shipping was to approach at a height of 100 feet at about 250 miles per hour and drop the bombs so that they ricocheted off the water and destroyed the target vessel. Naval People's Commissar Kuznetsov considered this method, called mast-top bombing, to be approximately five times more effective than horizontal bombing. They also developed a torpedo version of the IL-2 as well as a rocket gunship, reportedly carrying up to 12 RS-132 rockets. Despite its armor and redeveloped tactics, the IL-2 was slow and very vulnerable to attack, if unescorted. Luftwaffe fighters and anti-aircraft units claimed 6,900 victories over IL-2s in 1943 and a further 7,300 in 1944. Whilst these numbers might be exaggerated, on the other hand, the Soviet numbers of losses might not be correct either. According to Soviet records, the total wartime IL-2 losses amounted to nearly 11,570 aircraft. That's about 30% of the Soviet Union's total combat aircraft losses. Nevertheless, by the end of World War II, the IL-2 was widely regarded as one of the best and most effective weapons deployed by the Soviet forces. Oleg Rastrenin, a highly regarded expert on Soviet air power, notes that during World War II, it was precisely the IL-2 that was the most useful aircraft for our infantry and the aircraft most feared by the German infantry. According to Rastrenin, at the beginning of the war, IL-2s comprised less than 0.2% of the inventory of the Soviet Air Force, but soon this number rose and stayed at about 30% of all Soviet combat tactical aircraft for the duration of the war. For World War II, the Ilyushin IL-2 is an iconic aircraft, as iconic as the T-34 tank or the Katyusha rocket system, an aircraft that contributed significantly to the Allied victory over Nazi Germany. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, leave a comment, and share with your friends. If you would like to see more like this, please subscribe to the channel and tell your friends to do the same. Hoorah for now!